an investigative journalist from the Philippines. Journalists provide information that allows people to make decisions about their lives. Our investigation takes us to an insurgent stronghold. Democracies around the world continue to function because there are journalists out there still doing their jobs, risking their lives, still believing that they can make a difference. I came upon one more place where the tensions in the forest were coming to a head. In order to tell the story, someone like that had to be shown. He was still very frightened. He said that if the government knew that he had come to talk with me, he would be punished. If I could take it back, I would. Every single case of these unsolved civil rights murders was initiated by a reporter. When I was a boy, I wanted to do that. I knew about writing, I knew about reading. Uh, I wanted to do storytelling, and I had no idea how to get there. The first time I walked into a newsroom was the New York Times. I was 22 years old, and I was hooked completely. You walked into a room where typewriters were pounding, smoke was curling in the ceilings, and every day you had to do it. There was a deadline. A few months later, I got a phone call uh, at home. And an editor from the Times was on the phone, and he said, we want you to come to room 1111 at the Hilton Hotel tomorrow, and don't tell anybody you're coming there and bring enough clothes for a couple of months. And I said, who the hell is this? <laughs> and he said, this is Jerry Gold, and I mean it. The next day, I walked into the hotel, and it was the Pentagon Papers. I became part of the team as a 22-year-old that did one of the most important stories that this country's ever faced. And it taught me the value and the importance of journalism, and especially investigative reporting, and its role as a watchdog facing the abuses and the lies and the threats of the government. It was the beginning of a career that I had no idea I really was going to get into and how to start, but it was based on one thing. It was based on the love of the story, and it was based on passion. After the Times, I worked at the Boston Globe, and I ended up at the Philadelphia Inquirer. And what I wanted to do was be a foreign correspondent, and I got to do that. I was in Africa two weeks, and I was thrown into a jail in Uganda. I'm lucky I'm alive. Three weeks later, I was in the edge of Beirut with the Israeli army. About a day or two after that, I was driving with my driver, and a bullet went by my ear, and it went like that. And I said, what the hell was that? And my driver said, sniper. And I go, shit. And he goes, do not worry, he has missed. <laughs> <laughs> so I wanted to take chances. I wanted to face risk. And at that point, I should have gone home. I was a foreign correspondent in five weeks, but I didn't. I stayed in Africa, and what I learned in four years in Africa was about the world. I saw the most depraved people in the world at times, I saw the most deprived. I came back to Philadelphia, and I was dubbed Sir Knight, and I became an editor, something I never imagined doing. It really was about leadership, it was about ideas, it was about creativity. Eventually, I became the editor of the Philadelphia Inquirer, and eventually I got fired. I was in the first wave of big newspaper editors in the early 2000, 2001, when the conflict between profit and creativity and journalism came to a fore. There was a complete disconnect between the values of the journalist, because no journalist ever really started working in a newsroom or any place for money. They did it because of the drive of creativity, to potentially do the right thing, to potentially make a difference. And the values there did not meld. And this is what happened. And the newspaper business model completely collapsed with an inability to face the opportunities that technology was creating. After that, I came out here to San Francisco. I thought I had one more newspaper in me, and I became the editor, or the managing editor of The Chronicle. That didn't work either. Uh, I left there after about four and a half years, and I had decided that I was not going to go back to a newspaper, that I had my brains beat in too often, and I needed to be in an environment where the business side and the creative side were completely aligned. Now, how to do that? How do you look to the future at a time where nobody wanted to really invest in media and every news organization in the country was downsizing news organizations that were mainly based on profit and profit margins and not really purely based on what the journalists could do to inform society and make a difference? 
I had an idea what I wanted to do. I taught at Berkeley, and then a journalist was murdered in Oakland. His name was Chauncey Bailey. One morning he was going to work. He was the editor of the Oakland uh, Press, a small uh, African-American newspaper. And a man ran up to him, it was three years ago here, and assassinated him. Three blasts to a shotgun. The third, when he was on the ground, his head was nearly blown off. He was killed because he was a journalist. A group of journalists came together to start something called the Chauncey Bailey Project, and because I didn't have a job, uh, they asked me if I would help run it. Coming into that first meeting, there were about 30 news organizations, all on different platforms, all who had been competing. How do you get them to work together? Through collaboration and being driven by the story. The story was to try and figure out why Chauncey Bailey was murdered and to try and figure out what he was working on that would have gotten him killed. We did it. After about a year and a half, an incredible amount of storytelling and through an incredible amount of work and focus on what the story was, there were many indictments, and the trial of Chauncey Baylor's alleged killers is now going on in Oakland. But that taught me something. It really showed me the necessity of working together in this new model. So eventually, I, the Center for Investigative Reporting, which has been in existence since 1977, approached me about becoming the executive director. I had never worked in a nonprofit. I had no idea how to raise money. I really, if I think about it now, would never have done it, uh, because it's a bitch. But <laughs> it's incredibly rewarding. And what we're talking about here today is passion and drive and love. And this is what I love. Uh, you know, I love the newsroom the first time I walked into it. I can't believe it, over 40 years ago. And I love the storytelling today. But I had a very different idea. I wanted to take the core story, the core is the center, and think about the spokes of a wheel and all different spokes and platforms the way people get storytelling today. It was really not a totally new idea, but it was a very different idea. When you worked in a newspaper, you put the story in the newspaper. The internet came, you put the story on the internet. How do you evolve into an organization where at the core of the story, which in the inception, and our model is around unique, high-quality investigative reporting that can be trusted, create a team of people who have the skills to take that core story and create it on every platform. So if it's a print version, you have a print, print team, you have multimedia, you have video, which I agree is crucial to the future, you have interactive, you have radio. And when I went around and started to try and raise money, the foundations, they looked at me and thought I was crazy. This is right at the beginning of 2008. The stock market was crashing. Foundations were not giving out money. And I went around and people looked, gave me the fish eye. Now, one thing that was an advantage for me is I'd been around a long time and a lot of people knew me, so I had credibility. I had credibility as a journalist and I believed in the model, but it took 18 months and CIR almost closed to begin bringing in funding to build this model. So we had an idea, we had a vision, and we were not just simply looking to the future, we were looking to filling an important niche that exists today and a void. Since that time, CIR, when I got there, had seven people, now it is over 30. And we have evolved into one of the transformational models. And what we're doing is distributing stories to very wide audiences on every platform the way they want to get it. Now, the challenge is how do you sustain this? A word we've heard a lot today. And how do you tell the audience, tell the world, that what we do really makes a difference? What we're seeing around the world today and, and what's happening through social media is a huge ability to transform and get people engaged and get audience. The other opposite side of that, we, which we haven't talked about today, is the ability of others, governments really, or corporate interests, to use that same technology to control information, control movements, control people, really spy on people. There's, a, there's a, going to be a balance we're going to see going forward and, and a conflict really about the openness and the democratization of technology. We are going to, now, so I just want to give you an example of what we're doing because it's really remarkable. In the next week, we're going to do a story about seismic safety in schools in California. We've worked on it 19 months. This is not something you do with normal journalists. This is really difficult work. We've literally looked at tens of thousands of pages of documents. We've found documents. We've found information, hundreds of interviews getting people on the record. We've created a database, and this is really where you get to the new model of over every school in California, K through 12, over 10,000 schools. 
We had a conference call yesterday with 80 journalists from a news organization that's around California. Every one of their sites is going to use this story. The story will be broadcast nationally. The story will be broadcast in every market in California on commercial TV. It'll be broadcast on public radio throughout California and in NPR. It'll be in newspapers throughout California. And it's going to be on every website we can get it on. It also, and, it, and this is where you really need to think differently, who is the target audience of this story? We hope to get results. We hope to impact change. We hope to do a story. Frequently, investigative reporting and journalism is done after the fact when you identify victims. We all know about the lead up to the Iraq war. We know about the financial collapse of the banking, the huge criticism justified about journalism. Why don't we know about this? How do you do a story and get impact and results before the disaster happens? That's what we're hoping to do. One amazing element of this story, and it really gets to what you just heard about youth, one of the youngest staff members said, who really needs to know about this? It's kids in school. We did a coloring book. I said, what? So she said, let me try a coloring book. We've had orders for over 40,000 of these coloring books in California schools. It's going to be in two versions of Chinese, Vietnamese, Korean, English, and Spanish. I never would have thought about that. It's another way to get a story out. The challenge we face now is how do you sustain this? How do you keep it going? We're charging for our content. That story probably cost three quarters of a million dollars to do. We'll get about $30,000 in revenue. So I want to ask all of you, <laughs> not for anything, but to really think about how with your brain power, your understanding of technology, your understanding of where this is going and how social media is moving, how information is moving, how new platforms are going to be created, to somehow come together and work with people like me to solve this problem and really serve society. This is a crucial issue for all of us. It's a global issue, it's a local issue, and it's something that we have to educate the public about and really find a solution. Thank you.